Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reimagine 2021, the virtual blockchain conference series. I'm your host, Ashley Meredith, head of education over at Mousebelt Blockchain Accelerator. And today we're bringing you version 8.0 of our series, State of the Art Chain, uh, bringing you all the latest updates and news around exciting use cases for blockchain like NFTs and gaming uh, that's bringing so many more people into the space and contributing to adoption of blockchain technology. Today, I'm here with John Jordan. He's a blockchain games consultant and the editor of the website blockchaingamer.biz. Welcome, John. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Glad to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, you have been working in the gaming industry for quite a long time. Why don't you tell our viewers about your background and what made you decide to start looking into blockchain gaming? Mm, absolutely. So yes, I've been in the game space now for um, over 20 years. Um, so kind of seen, seen a lot of different kind of uh, tech, tech cycles, um, starting back with kind of PlayStation 2 you know, back then. Um, and uh, so I went for kind of through the cycle of kind of PC console. And then I spent um, about 15 years in mobile games. So I, I kind of co-founded a, a mobile game website that got, got pretty big called Pocket Gamer. Um, and then I kind of spent a good kind of, a, you know, a good period of time playing a lot of games and, and particularly writing about the business aspects of games. So particularly into the sort of the finances of companies and, and how they sort of make money. And in mobile, I was particularly interested about free to play. So when the free to play model came along, that was quite radical. You gave away your game for free and, and then you tried to charge kind of small or, or quite large uh, amounts of money for kind of extra things in the game, extra gems or, or things like that. Um, Those sneaky in-game purchases. Yes. Right? Yes, but, 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 uh, but as, been phenomenally successful so so mobile games is now the, the biggest single part of gaming so so there's like pc gaming and console gaming about the same um kind of about 30 40 billion dollars of revenue a year and then there's mobile games which is enormous like you know 70 80 billion dollars um and that's all from free to play games so it's very successful um but then i after a, a, about you know um a certain period of time in that i, I kind of felt i kind of you know it, I, i'd learned what i what i need, sort of needed to learn um, and I was kind of looking out, you know, uh, what's going to come next in games. So we've had the consoles, we've had, you know, um, kind of mobile getting really big. And then there were, you know, obviously things got kind of VR. Everyone was kind of very excited about VR for, for, for a bit. And um, so I had a look at that. And then people got very excited about esports. So I had a look at sort of esports. And, and none of them really, um, well, I could see, you know, they're, they're, they're very interesting. Um, they're bringing something new to games. I couldn't really see them being sort of a, a, big, um, a big wave that would affect, you know, all, all game makers. Um, and, and I was really sort of, sort of struggling actually, actually to find something to kind of focus on. Um, and I actually went to a conference um, and uh, at the conference, they had a few talks about, about blockchain and I didn't really know very much about blockchain. I'm a kind of vaguely someone who's into technology. I kind of, kind of you know, known, known a bit about it, but hadn't really seen any um, application to games. Um, and literally it was like a, I think a four hour, four hour um, kind of session of various talks. And um, it was literally that kind of moment where you're sitting down in a conference room and like a light bulb goes off in your brain. I'm just like, whoa, OK, I understand what this is now. This is this is like a, you know, a new way of, of kind of creating games and, and a new business mechanic for games. And, and it's going to really, you know, I, I, I felt then and, and still do really going to kind of revolutionize the way games are made, the way games are played, the communities around games, you know, basically everything. And I, I don't think obviously at the time I realized sort of uh, quite the significance of of, of what, of what blockchain is going to do for games. I mean, that, that's only kind of deepened, I think, as I spent the last kind of kind of three years, um, you know, really engrossed in it. Um, but but it's still that sort of passion that, um, you know, I, I, I can't say exactly when it's going to take off, but I can't see that in 10 years time, it won't have taken off at some point, you know, if, if that's if that makes sense. So it, it, it's not a it's, it's not a if it's it's a when kind of kind of thing for me. Absolutely. So for someone who has been tuned into the world of gaming for so long, um, I think it's interesting for our viewers to kind of understand what there's obviously been so many technological advances in gaming, uh, the actual gaming experience, but it seems like the other thing that has really revolutionized gaming is how companies are monetizing. Um, so could you give us just a snapshot of what some of the biggest advancements you've seen happen in gaming and why you think blockchain is up there with some of those like really big revolutions in, mm. in gaming. Absolutely. So I think, you know, I, I would say um, sort of the, the, the first um, kind of way that kind of game game started out uh, and, and obviously still exists is, is basically someone, someone makes a game. It is sort of a, 
um, a, a finite bit of uh, kind of entertainment. Obviously, it may have multiplayer, all that kind of things. But it's, it's basically sort of a sort of a thing, um, and it costs a certain sum of money. Let's say kind of fifty dollars, and people go, "Oh, that game sounds really interesting. I buy, spend fifty dollars on it. Um, I get the entertainment, um, and and then I play it. It's sort of sort of a, a one a one you know a one payment sort of model. Obviously, there's kind of variants on that. There's kind of subscription models, and, and I guess all games now are sort of what we call games as a service. They're always being updated, um, really. Um, but but fundamentally, there's this kind of idea that you sort of pay pay once and you get the get the game. And I kind of think that's still where most of the sort of hardcore gamers sort of are. That, that's kind of what you know. They like to know they paid their money. They, they're not going to be nickel and dime for all these other things. You know, that, hardcore gamers don't like that. Um, but then mobile came along and free to play, and it was it was a combination of two things. One, it was because we had we did have free to play before, so PC games, particularly in Asia, in places like China, um, where you have a lot of piracy, um, and and you couldn't charge fifty dollars for a game. They basically kind of created free to play, so you got got the game for free, and then you paid extra for things in the game. That was like an anti piracy model. Um, that's how it started out, but it never got very big um, until mobile came in. And obviously, the thing with mobile, it came in with app stores, so suddenly you had at that point, tens of millions of people, then quickly hundreds of, mil hundreds of millions of people, and now whatever it is, 2.5 billion people in the world have a smartphone connected to either you know, uh, Google Play Store or the, or the Apple App Store, can download content um, and, and have some sort of payment mechanic connected to, to that game through the App Store. So suddenly you have this massive explosion in accessibility. So every, pretty much everyone in the world, not well, okay, half the world, can now play a mobile game. Um, but obviously half the world is not going to spend even like five dollars or even a dollar um, up front to, to experience a, a game so you have to give it away to them free and then the ones who want to pay or can pay can you know um, can can do so and that's that's where we see kind of free-to-play mobile becoming so big um, so the thing that I, I, I kind of worked out or have worked out over the years is, is how's blockchain going to change that because in some ways um, you know it's much more complicated <laughs> you know we're not going to see two billion people interacting with, with blockchains um, anytime soon um, but I think what we have seen already in the last kind of three years I've seen is 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 the way game blockchain uh, the way that games that are using blockchain and they, there's many different ways in which games can use blockchain um, but the, the only that, that those games can only be successful really if the community is also um, kind of t kind of having its share of the kind of value success of, of that game. So we can take an example like Fortnite. Fortnite, you know, one of the most successful games um, over the last kind of few years. You know, Epic Games have, have generated billions of dollars of revenue, so that's basically people paying them for content in the game. Um, and while those people have had billions of dollars worth of entertainment, clearly, because Fortnite is a great experience and it's very social, you can bring your friends in and we'll have a great time. Um, no, no one legally has, has you know, uh, being, been, been able to sort of trade things in Fortnite or or basically have a great character with all the gear and then sell that to, to another player. You, I mean, people do sell their accounts, but that's illegal. Um, and blockchain, I think for me, is, is, is a way of, and it's not purely about um, people making money, but I think it is, we all know people are prepared to spend money on games and prepared to spend, you know, thousands of hours or, you know, whatever many hours um, in games because they enjoy the experience. Um, and to a degree, they are then kind of uh, helping that that game build a community, build, build a you know a good community, hopefully become an enjoyable experience. And a blockchain will allow that users to to take a share of that. Um, so, in, in going back to like a, like a Fortnite comparison, which we all tend to end up with a kind of a Fortnite comparison, is you know if that was was happening on a, on a blockchain, then um, the play the players. If they own some of the characters there and they could kind of resell them in a marketplace the the developer would, would obviously make money because they they create the ip they're the one who's kind of in, in control of it but to a degree and i think over time this will become more so the community will have a, a larger say in what goes on in the game and i think this is probably a few years down the line but we have ideas of things like uh like DAOs, like uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that are sort of new ways of putting together communities and companies on a blockchain in a way that you know you, you don't really have this is the company and this is the community you're all kind of part of the same thing so so i think there's quite a lot to unpick there i've probably um confused people by combining too many things together but but that's kind of part of the kind of vision that i see at least no yeah i, I find that so interesting i think that especially younger generations and just people nowadays are starting to wake up to the fact that we are 
the consumers are the reason why these companies are making money. Uh, they're making money off of our ad views. Uh, they're making money off of our data and we should be a part of that and, and you know, receive dividends, right? Um, that, you know, we have things like Brave Browser where now I can get paid if I'm willing to watch ads, um, if I spend hours on a game and, and, and especially like a multi-massive, you know, a uh, role-playing game with lots of people, like it takes that community to even make that game fun. So they should be rewarded. Uh, for anyone who's just tuning in uh, to our Reimagine 2021 conference series, uh, just want to point you to our YouTube channel, you know, go over there, smash that subscribe button. We have a lot of great interviews. Uh, one of them I would recommend people check out is uh, with Brock Pierce. So he mm -hmm. had, you know, in learning from him and how he got into the industry, it seems like people in gaming are uniquely poised to understand something like cryptocurrency or NFTs or these kind of digitized assets. So in his early days, you know, World of Warcraft, people were mining digital gold, right, to be able to buy in-game assets. And he just found that uh, that community was uniquely primed to accept something like cryptocurrencies. Uh, do you have any thoughts or opinions on that as someone in the gaming industry? Hmm. No, I think I think it absolutely is the case. So um, particularly for these big uh, MMORPGs, World of Warcraft being probably the biggest one, but also kind of Diablo 2 was a, I mean, that wasn't an MMO, but, but uh, another big sort of PC game. And, 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 and I, think it's, I think it's interesting that 10 years ago, you know, those games were sort of created or more than 10 years ago now. And, and, and the big problem they sort of had was um, because they didn't have, you know, because blockchain technology hadn't, you know, did, hadn't been even kind of, in, you know, sort of invented is the wrong word, but, you know, hadn't been kind of thought of and hadn't been um, certainly deployed. That, that basically what people were doing were, were mining all these in-game currencies, these, these, this kind of gold, and then illegally selling it onto people. Um, so there wasn't a way of building kind of a, a marketplace that allowed people to do that in an official manner. I mean, one of the things Brock was trying to do was 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 sort of to do that. Um, didn't quite didn't kind of work out. But uh, um, but the other thing was, you know, the obviously with, with a blockchain, you get around sort of this idea of sort of sort of double spending. So so kind of um, having having an asset that is kind of decentralized, but but controlled in terms of the spending. And certainly in terms of something like Bitcoin, obviously it, 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 there's a fixed amount out there. I mean, different blockchains have sort of different approaches to that. So um, not necessarily all of them have the same idea, but the problem you have is something like World of Warcraft, certainly over time is inflation that just, the more people play the more, the, and the longer they play, the more my, gold that's mined, then the, the more devalued gold becomes over this. So they often have, they have this kind of economic problem that they have to keep adding higher and higher and more expensive items to soak up all the, all the gold. Otherwise the gold really becomes uh, valueless. So, um, I think kind of fundamentally blockchains do um, kind of solve some of these problems. Now, they definitely create a lot of problems as well. So I'd be the first to say, I think, I think blockchain solve some of the fundamental problems. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of why I'm um, bullish on, on blockchains and gaming. Um, I, I, the, over the last kind of couple of years, I think we have sort of seen, they throw up some, some other problems, which are not significant problems, I don't think. They're more problems about kind of user experience, so at the moment, it's still a big issue. How do, you, how do you get people into a blockchain game in a way that they sort of understand um, you know, what it is? We've seen different approaches to that. Um, we obviously have ideas, different kind of, I guess, kind of um, philosophies about whether things should be custodial or non-custodial. And probably you know, some of the audits you know, don't even understand what that means in the first place. Um, so we have- Yeah, well, let me, let, me, let me slow you down then yeah. there and kind of tease out because Right now, we're kind of in this NFT boom. Mm -hmm. New people are coming into the space, artists, celebrities. Uh, everyone's really excited about these applications of blockchain. Um, but there are downsides, right? And with different kinds of protocols you use, you're always sacrificing security for more privacy or whatever it may be. So what are some of the challenges for game developers using blockchain? Like you said, um, the user needs to understand uh, it needs to be presented in, to them in a way that they understand. But my question would be like, does the game player even need to know that blockchain is being utilized or do they just need to know the value proposition that mm. they're earning money on their game? Mm. Yeah, exactly. So um, I definitely see sort of two broad camps really. Um, and, and sort of up to this point, broadly, we've seen the people who are trying to make blockchain games or games using the blockchain. Um, have 
tended to come from the kind of uh, kind of crypto enthusiast, blockchain kind of kind of enthusiast kind of in, environment. So they probably um, very sort of ETH Ethereum focused. They probably got very excited when CryptoKitties came out, and that's kind of the approach they've taken. And they've they've sort of um, taken a, like a blockchain first point of view. They've not always done that consciously, but just that's the, that's how they come at it. You know, they're, they're blockchain people, and I guess probably. Um, that's kind of the where I'm coming from as well. So you know, people who know how to how to use MetaMask and are kind of comfortable with that. Um, I think we're starting to see now the first wave of people who are coming at it from a sort of games first um, uh, kind of experience. And those are people who are have probably been in the game space um, already. Have probably set up companies, successful companies, making maybe PC games, maybe mobile games, um, and and they're maybe you know sort of a bit have my sort of story that they're kind of looking for the next thing um, and have come to blockchain and they are they, they kind of realize much more you know kind of kind of you know what you just said there that the audience really doesn't care what technology these things are operating on and and they know if you're you know you have a game that has millions of players they just know you know adding a tiny bit of complexity into any part of the game just just you know ruins the experience for people so those so you know those that kind of group of people looks at metamask and just kind of you know kind of their heads explode as if they think you can get a million people playing a game using MetaMask. So I think we're starting to see um, a much more kind of paired back approach there. I mean, the best example is a game called Blanco's Block Party, um, which is in open beta. It's a PC game. Now, the, the, the team behind that have come from companies like Blizzard and Activision. So they've run some pretty, you know, serious mass market games. And and they don't even use the term blockchain. I think if you can look through all their marketing, you would probably probably you know find it hard to find the term blockchain. Um, and 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 because of that, they've, they've sort of created their own blockchain. It's, it's a private, it's a kind of custom version of, a, of the EOS blockchain. If people care about that sort of stuff, at the moment it's it's kind of um, you know you can't you don't have your private keys. You know, <laughs> probably going again to, getting too complex already. But but basically, you you log in with an email and a password. And if you want to buy some of these characters, they're NFTs in the game called Blancos. They're kind of cute little vinyl characters. Um, you just buy them um, with, with, with a credit card. Now they're going to open up the blockchain side of it increasingly over time. So if, if you're happy owning things in a private wallet, you can sort of do that. But but at the moment they're, they're just like you know they're very serious. They want a million players, and they realise that the the only way to do that is basically to make it you know it, you know. Um, What's the word? Uh, they make it kind of exactly the same as playing a PC game, any other PC game. So you have an email and a password. If you lose your password, you email support and say, I've lost my password. And they don't go, well, it's a MetaMask. No one can know your password. You've lost all your stuff, sucker. You know, <laughs> so, so I think we're starting to, starting to see those kind of people coming in. And, and people, are, people I know as well, more generally in the, in the game space who haven't really been into blockchain um, are now starting to go, partly from what you say, this kind of NFT boom, they're starting to say, um, so, so what are blockchain games? What, what should I be looking at? So I, I think we're starting to see, you know, this kind of inflection point, not necessarily in terms of take up from players, but in terms of take of the industry, the games industry starting to become a bit more open because previously I found the games industry has actually been quite indifferent or, or, or actually quite negative to blockchain um, for reasons I'm not entirely sure about. Yeah. So, uh, to speak to that point, um, you have a blog, um that is uh where can people find your blog <laughs> well yes i have a, i just started a, a substack so it's called uh, games games tx uh on on substack which is like a yeah kind of a weekly sort of sort of um kind of you know, my, my my views on, on what's going on with, with blockchain games yeah yeah that's great so anyone tuning in who is interested in learning more or, or following john um as he covers different things that are coming up in the blockchain gaming industry. It's gamestx.substack. Um, you had an article in there commenting on a major games journalist coming out or journalism uh, platform coming out and saying that they weren't gonna cover blockchain gaming. Can you mm. tell our viewers about that and why you think that might yes. be? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of odd. I, I'll have to... Um sort of a, a caveat caveat this a little bit so so um 
yeah, uh, games, gamesindustry.biz is one of the big, um, what we call kind of B2B business, business kind of sites covering games. It's been around, goodness knows how long, um, get it, probably getting for 20 years. And, and I, I sort of have a, have a, have a half an axe to grind because, because when I was, before I got into blockchain, they were sort of my, my big competitor when I was running a, another, um, website so 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 i'm very sensitive to what they say <laughs> um but uh what was funny was um was one of their sort of senior senior writers um you know really good writer covers games really well very experienced um, put, put out this this kind of um i mean it's almost like a it, it would have been an opinion but obviously because it was it was like we're not going to cover blockchain games it was more like a like a, a mission statement for the site so so obviously it was his personal opinion but obviously they wanted to um, kind of sort of formalize something that all of the, all of them on, on this on this website thought and um and it was kind of it was, it was interesting because there was there was some nuance there but basically it seemed to be that and, and I guess you know probably anyone in blockchain gets a sort of similar thing that that there's still kind of concern about things like you know a, a lots of terrorists using bitcoin to do bad things or you know uh, um and, and there's a general still um you know, I guess concern, and it, to some degree, you know, rightly when you when you take away all the gatekeepers, when something is decentralized, then then you know potentially, um, you know, bad bad things can happen. Um, but it was a bit odd. I felt from a, from a games kind of company, a, a games um, kind of a media site, which is, you know, games in general is very forward and looking at te technology all the time, and and you know, there's never I don't think there's ever been a bit of technology created over the last 50 years that someone hasn't tried to make a game with it you know just game people just love sort of love technology um but they put out this statement saying they weren't going to cover blockchain and they, they thought it was a bit all a bit shady um and it, it kind of got worse than that so they, they kind of had this like moral case um it wasn't quite clear how they made that it, um i think that they, they kind of said well we don't we don't cover there's quite a lot of kind of gambling games in mobile and they kind of said well we don't cover these gambling games um, they don't feel that's kind of kind of right. And we, we kind of we put, you know, they kind of equivocated kind of blockchain with, with, with that and they just kind of didn't feel right morally about it. Um, and they really hoped blockchain games um, wouldn't be wouldn't be successful. So it's, that, that was more the, the odd statement that they, they not that they wouldn't weren't going to cover it. I could sort of understand that, but they weren't going to cover it because morally they kind of felt it was in some way um, kind of kind of morally wrong. Um, but then they had the caveat at the bottom saying, but of course, if, if, if big companies like Ubisoft, um, uh, who, are, who are quite interested in blockchain, if big companies like Ubisoft are, are talking about blockchain, then, then obviously we'll cover that. So you're kind of like, well, you're, gonna, you're having your cake and eating it. You know, you kind of have to choose, choose one thing or the other. Um, but obviously that was, that was more my personal decision. I thought that was funny because I'm so into blockchain games. That's pretty much all I do these days. So I thought it was funny from that point of view. But uh, I also felt from uh, having been an ed editor of a website, you're... When you put that statement up, you know, when you put the flag up the flagpole, you immediately, you know, open yourselves up to, to any time anything about blockchain gaming um, is in the news, then people will be sort of either laughing at you or saying, why didn't you cover that? Or, you know, you're just creating a target for, you, for yourself. And of course, what has happened is in, in the few weeks since then, um, we have had, I think, quite a lot of uh, mainstream uh, kind of news. So there's a big, a big Korean uh, mobile game uh, publisher called uh, Game Bill has bought has, has um, spent about thirty billion thirty million dollars buying um, some shares in one of the big crypto exchanges in South Korea, um, and then a, a, a fairly large uh, VC company that just invests in games has just you know, announced last week that they were setting up a new fund, so a new fund to invest in companies, games companies, and it was only going to be blockchain games companies. So, so I just kind of felt it was, for lots of different reasons. I, I kind of it kind of made me chuckle, but maybe that's maybe I'm, I'm a I'm an evil person. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, surprising for a games media company. Um, usually, like you said, uh, games are always on the forefront of technology, always interested in emerging tech and very just forward thinking. So um, it, it is surprising that they would decide to opt out when there's so much exciting stuff happening. Um, before I ask you more about like what, you know, most excites you about blockchain gaming what kind of the new newest uh nft stuff that's happening has been exciting for you um like to hear a little bit more about your background in journalism how did you get started doing that and uh, do you have any advice for students tuning in who might be interested in writing interested in games and is thinking about you know focusing those talents into the blockchain industry 
Mm, mm. Um, <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I, I guess the, uh, the my experience of, of games journalism is, is that um, the people I know best do, do, not, do not have very encouraging um, kind of stories to tell about how they got into games journalism. Um, so, um, but uh, uh, my one kind of falls into that context. So um, I guess, how will I start? So I was um, really into journalism. So I did, I did uh, as a student, we had a, a student magazine. So I did um, journalism there. I was actually doing engineering. So um, I'm not a journalism student, but kind of into, in, interested in technology. So I guess that's the kind of two things. Um, and and I um, I did have various sort of writing, uh, you know, professional writing jobs, not about games or technology as it was, but I, I was, um, so I guess I I had a sort of a, a sort of a passion for writing and I had some sort of formal training in writing, although not a journalism um, uh, education. Um, and, uh, but, but how I got my, my first job in games uh, journalism was, was actually um, a one of my friends got a, got a job in games journalism. So that's, that's sort of a terrible, um, not, not very easy to, to replicate um, kind of bit of advice. Um, and, and as it happened, he was leaving. So it, it was sort of a complicated thing, but he, he was working for a games publication and he left. So they had a sort of a, a, a uh, opportunity there. Um, and I had actually been doing a bit of writing for them. I've been doing some book reviews um, back in back, back when games magazines had reviewed books, bizarrely. Um, so I had a sort of foot in the door there. Um, uh, more generally, if people are interested in games journalism, I would um, I would say um, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so um, I mean, in, in some ways, in some ways, it's never been better to game journalism. Is, in some ways, it's never been more open. I think. I mean, certainly when I started out, um, you know, it was it was. Kind of print publication so there, there were a few there were some websites there but it, you know web, web wasn't the thing as obviously now it's totally flipped um and um i i think when when you had to be a print journalist you you kind of you, there were sort of higher standards you needed to um kind of meet in terms of like your technical writing had to be quite good um i, I think with the web it it's, it's, it's in a sense it's easier because there's so many more web publications but that makes it harder because there's so many more people can sort of apply for them so um i, I think the one thing you have to prove is or the two things you have to prove one one is you have to be passionate so obviously there's for a lot of people their, their dream job is being a games journalist because they literally think all you do is you play games all day um and for some people that may be all they do but um if you want to have a career um i, I think you have to think quite quickly about what what you're doing that other people aren't doing because if, if you're just if you're just you know reviewing games or just writing up the, the press release i mean there are literally a million people in the world probably you know you know tens of millions of people in the world who can do that so are, are you like to be the best person at doing that well you're not but if, but if you're um you know if you're certainly when it comes to blockchain if you if you're an sort of um can prove you have expertise in in sort of writing you're you know about games you're passionate about um, this particular weird thing, blockchain games. I mean, there are at the moment, I think, you know, you know, I would say certainly less than a hundred journalists who understand anything about blockchain games. Probably less than ten in the world who, who I would say, are sort of good at it. So, um, you know, I would say that kind of specialist area is, if it interests you, would be something to go for. If it doesn't interest you, don't pretend that it interests you. You know, find find something that really interests you. Whether it's, you know, I don't know what it is. You could be into really really crazy Japanese RPGs, or you could be into, you know, a VR, that'd be a good one, I think, at the moment, because that's, that's still quite an open field. But you have to, you have to find, like, something, some little niche um, that, that you can kind of show, show off your talents, show that you can write well, show that you have passion for. Um, and the great thing about, obviously, kind of, you know, online stuff is, is you, can, you can create your own blog now, you know, you can create a YouTube channel just doing videos of those things that you really, you know, really like. And then, um, and then when you're coming to someone and, and saying, I, I love your website, you, you know, I'm all about blockchain games too, you know, let me show you my stuff. That just makes it easy because, you know, the worst thing that happens is that as an editor um, is, is, you, is you have like, you know, you have a, you have a job uh, going, you have a thousand people apply for it. It's almost impossible to kind of filter that. Um, and they all say they're, they're brilliant at, at it. And, you know, anything that can just make you go, well, 990 you don't have to worry about because i've got these 10 here they, they've been running or this one's got a youtube channel this one's been running a podcast this one's just got a little blog you know this one's just done a, a 500 word article about the best thing that's come out in the last year and it's a really good article you know this makes stuff easier um for the for the, for the kind of uh, person who's, who's 
trying to work out who, who, who that um uh that, that job is going to go to the other thing which is, again is, is not so helpful but i think sometimes if you just um if you can solve problems for people that that, that goes quite a long way so um I, I guess i guess it becomes sort of an issue about sort of interns and people have different views on on i guess the morality of interns but if you can just go to you know even some fairly big websites and say you know i can write you one one story a day um i, I just don't want to do it for like a month and and, and and if it's stuff that could be published, then then you're just really helping out, you know, some of some of these sites. So um, something like that. But it, but it is it is getting your foot in the door is the hard thing. I suppose now at least you can follow people on Twitter and and sort of post on their YouTube and, and be part of a community. Um, um, that bit's easier at least. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to show your passion, really. Yeah, well, I think that's great advice. It really just echoes a lot of the things that our uh, interviewees have said before in interviews with me, which is, uh, you know, take what you're passionate about and what you're good at already. And if you apply blockchain to that, it really presents a good opportunity to, for you to have a kind of niche that you can fit into and really kind of stand out uh, if you build your expertise in like, you know, some domain expertise. Cause I work with students who are, you know, law students, environmental students, uh, philosophers, um, all sorts of backgrounds that aren't necessarily technologically based, but uh, you know, encourage them to get to know the technology, um, specialize in blockchain because that will really set them apart. Um, so to kind of round out our conversation, uh, reimagine 2021 version 8.0. If anyone is just joining us, this is our state of the art chain. Uh, we're kind of catching the wave of this NFT boom, talking about these exciting use cases for gaming, for art. Um, what are some of the most exciting use cases um, adoption, celebrities uh, that have kind of jumped on this NFT train in the last uh, month or so? Mm. So, so yes, yeah, so there's definitely been kind of 20, 2021 has been this kind of a kind of NFT boom. So coming at it from the games point of view, I'm, uh, I, <laughs> it's not that I would say I'm against NFT art um, per se, I th I, but I, I kind of think um, the ease of creation um, of, of kind of NFT art pieces, um, particularly obviously sort of static, static based art is, has, has sort of, you know, that, that's been, that's, that's been the kind of uh, the launch pad for the boom, but that's also sort of been, um, has very quickly created problems in terms of kind of, you know, IP ownership and, and, and you know, do, do you have, should you be minting that, that NFT um, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So I, th I think there is definitely the, the art thing um, kind of caught headlines with, with, with all the money being made. And and I guess um, that Scottish that to me kind of is kind of the lowest level of kind of a validation about you know, people care about owning digital items. Um, I, I think maybe maybe some of the headlines about the the enormous uh, amounts of money these things are going for is not very helpful. Um, I think actually that's where games can can come in. So um, the problem with games is obviously it takes you know probably at least a year to make a good game. Um, and so that's why um, we haven't seen, I don't think, a lot of blockchain games and the ones that have come out have, have not really been terribly, terribly good for, for various reasons. Um, but I think you can imagine any, um, you, know, just a, you know, a standard game where you probably would have a character and maybe you'd have in-game items. Um, and, and it's quite easy, I think, conceptually to, to imagine that you have a, that character in, in the game is something that is secured on a blockchain, secured to your account. And as you play that character and it levels up and you get better gear and you can attach the gear and, and, and you know, that character within the game is becoming more powerful and, and having more um, uh, kind of utility in the game. So you can imagine that and people obviously get very attached to it. If you've spent a thing, you know, a thousand hours playing, playing in uh, a, uh, you know, a character in a game and, and kind of level up all the stats and everything, that's not only is that kind of um, other people in the game look at that character and go, that's great, but you, you actually have an emotional attachment to it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that that character is going to be worth like a million dollars or something like some of the some of the art thing is. Um, and I think one of the things we haven't really seen yet in blockchain games is how how we kind of combine this idea of kind of value, which is kind of personal emotional value and financial value. Because obviously the thing about a blockchain is there is always value attached to every transaction. I mean, that's that's sort of the, the inherent thing of a blockchain. Um, so the good thing, I think, with, with games is... Um, at the beginning, you can have these very low uh, 
uh, low cost items. And I think that that is something that one of the reasons that the NFT art thing is sort of the bubble sort of burst in the way it did was it, it became it, be, it was seen as kind of exploitative and like, you know, you, you couldn't you couldn't get into into that kind of scene. I mean, maybe something like kind of CryptoPunks now. You know, CryptoPunks were given away well, it was three and a half years ago, and now the cheapest one's $30,000. I mean, that, that doesn't seem very enticing to, to most of us. But if you're buying something that's, that's worth $10, and then you can kind of play that in a game, and maybe over a certain, you know, tens of hours, hundreds of hours, you know, create a character that might be worth $20, then that seems like a more, um, uh, you know, a, a, a more kind of scalable way of people getting into games. And that's kind of how I see it. So obviously these things over time may be worth, you know, thousands of thousands of dollars. But, but I would quite like to see games coming in and sort of re, sort of creating a new um, meaning around NFTs, which is they are things that you use in a game. They're things that may have financial value that you can sell on to other players. Um, obviously, we've seen with things like kind of collectible NFTs, which are a little bit different from the art NFTs, things like the NBA Top Shop thing that people really do like sort of just collecting things as well. I mean, I think that's, that's a slightly more nuanced kind of, kind of use case. People like making complete sets of things and people like owning kind of I guess in that case real world things because they like players or teams or something like that so, so I think NFTs can be used in many different ways uh, and I think just the games will as, as as blockchain games sort of come out and gain traction and and they they will that, that will be sort of where the learning starts to come in and I think that will be the learning for the game developers but also that will feed into the whole kind of NFT space that people will, will there'll be a more kind of nuance it won't just be this NFT is worth this amount of money which is I kind of think where we still are at the moment which is which is fine if you own these expensive NFTs, <laughs> but, but yeah. for the rest of us is, 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 is yeah, I think can be off-putting. And I think that sometimes that's where the negative, the negativity about NFTs comes along um, because it's seen as, well, that, 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 that's just kind of, that's invented money um, and people get very, um, I mean, there is a sort of- a, a good way for people to launder money. I've heard that one. Yeah, and I think, I, <laughs> like, I think, I think some of these Some, things someone's moving crypto around <laughs> yeah and there is this kind of kind of idea that yeah you can you know if you have a lot of crypto you can just buy your buy your own nft and suddenly you've still got your crypto and you've created this thing that's worth a lot of money i mean i don't i don't know how much of that goes on um but, but i just think games games you know is is, is more open and I, and I think what's interesting is as well that for some of the games we know have been announced and are coming out um you know, they are not necessarily kind of super hardcore games. You know, there's a game called um, Star Girls. Actually, actually, it's an existing mobile franchise that they're. I don't know how they're going to do it. I'm not seeing any detail, but that's a game. You know, like a sort of a dressing up style customization game that appeals to kind of um, kind of young teen uh, kind of girls. So, so there's kind of you know interesting experiences you wouldn't think were coming to blockchain. And I think kind of we're seeing that with some of the fandom type stuff. So, like Doctor Zeus NFTs are coming to to blockchain now that, that's not a game but that's you know dr zeus that's not the first that's not immediately what i think of when i think what's going to come to blockchain so i, I kind of think this year we will see um uh you know a, a broadening um of of the type of nfts coming and i think that will be um good and and that, that will that will sort of you know once you have proper mass market ip then sort of the you know the kind of mass market will follow that as long as you're not asking them to install metamask yeah. Uh, well, then I have to ask you: Have hmm. you minted an NFT yet? I have. Yes. So, so I've uh, I've done it. I did. Um, I, I messed around with some stuff. So I just kind of minted some some photos uh, back in the day. But 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 um, yes, I I went through a phase when when the um, when Rareable came out, the kind of the, the art platform. Um, that 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 um, yeah, I, we kind of created a few um, a few kind of funny gifts and things like that. Um, and. Uh, and we sold one of them, so, so uh, but it was a kind of interesting experience because it does make you, it did make you think, you know, how, okay, we, we kind of think these are quite funny, sort of me, they're like meme-based um, NF, NFT gifts around kind of some of the famous people in blockchain, um, but how can you create value um, around them? And so, so you, you sort of had to create sets and you had to, how many were you going to mint? And um, yeah, it didn't work out, but it was, it was an interesting experience. Uh, I think it's, it's something, something people, people should play around with in a fun way. Yeah, I wanted to mint an NFT as a joke for a friend. It was a Polaroid picture of the people. Yeah, yeah. Like $69 million yeah. sale. I just like took a Polaroid picture of it and put that up as an NFT. And I was going to do it on like OpenSea or Rarible. And, you know, with Ethereum gas fees these yeah. days, I think yes. with this NFT boom, 
it's really pushing people to look at other platforms and other uh, ways of, of uh, minting NFTs. So I actually did it on the Tezos network, um, you know, really, um, but if I, if I wasn't already, you know, initiated into blockchain, I would not have been able to figure out, you know, how to buy whatever tokens I needed of some other blockchain and write down my seed phrase and all these different things. So really looking forward to the user experience, you know, getting better and for artists to really take advantage of um, this new way of creating value and engaging with their fans. Um, so you have an, minted an NFT before. Um, what is your favorite blockchain game? What game are you hmm. playing right now? Well, uh, I'm one of these terrible people who sort, of, who sort of ducks the question by by saying I, I sort of dabble in everything. So it's, it's sort of my job to kind of de- kind of experience as, as many as possible. Um, so I, I, but I would say, um, let's have a think. Um, so one I've been playing uh, a lot recently, just because it sort of really blew up, was this one was one called Alien Worlds, which is on the Wax blockchain, which is actually a fairly um, easy blockchain to get into. You just need a, a kind of an email and a password, so it's, it's kind of um, uh, you don't need any complex kind of seed phrase. Um, it's, I would I would say it's not it's not a very exciting game to play at all. Uh, it's not finished yet. That's the, the problem with most blockchain games that are live now. Is is there is there um, uh, yeah, you know, probably a long way from being finished. So, so they they tend to sort of launch something and then see if they can build a community and then then go. These other features are coming. So, so that game is is just basically the moment you can just mint you can just mint a token and you 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 the better NFTs you um you have equipped the kind of more of this token you can mint. So they're very basic loop there. Um, it was interesting because it got very popular very quickly. But uh, that's a, another story. I won't go into that. Um, as I mentioned, there's Blanco's Block Party, which is probably probably the the, um, the easiest uh, blockchain game in terms of kind of getting into and getting a good experience because the only thing it has is these these characters called blankos they're little like vinyl toys um, and they're all like limited edition drops so that's kind of where the the kind of the blockchain is used to kind of secure those to your account but the rest of the game um, you just sort of run around that they have this kind of crazy crazy world where you can kind of run around and, and, and kind of uh, play these mini games and if you want to you can get there's a whole kind of uh, kind of building thing where you can build like mini games create your own sort of mini games racing games and stuff um so so that, that that's kind of an interesting one um I, I guess the the kind of one that the well there's there's two that the kind of the old school blockchain people like so one's called axie infinity uh, which is probably you know it's been going for three years now it, it is probably the most serious of of the blockchain games out there um, you have these, these again, NFTs called axes. You need three of them. You can battle them against other people. So it has that kind of battle element. Um, they have land as an NFT. So they have this, again, kind of a roadmap over a number of years where they have land and you can build things on them and, and you can kind of create these kind of persistent worlds. Um, and then there's another one called Splinterlands, which I always kind of say to people is, if you've never played a blockchain game, I always think Splinterlands is probably the best example of using um nfts and uh, in-game currency which is a cryptocurrency and just an email and a password to log in it's basically like a like a version of hearthstone it's like a simpler version of hearthstone i'm a terrible player of hearthstone i mean it's much too complicated for me um but it's kind of spin plans is just at the right level you kind of pick a deck of cards there's various rules various mana points you pick a you pick your cards um and then you play against someone else see who wins and if you win you win a very small amount of this cryptocurrency called dark energy crystals um, so you're kind of having this, uh, you know, the, the, the better you are at the game, the more the crystals you win. Um, all the cards on there are NFTs. It's on the Hive blockchain, but they're very cheap. So you can buy that. You know, I think the most expensive card there is that you would want to buy is like about hundred dollars. Most of them are about, you know, 50 cents a dollar. You, as you get more cards, you can kind of level up the cards you've got by kind of fusing them together. It, you know, it does everything you'd expect um, as, as, a, as a kind of decent game and, and implements blockchain very well. So um, that would be the one, that's the one I always kind of tell people, if you've never played a blockchain game, play Spin Lands. You do have to pay $10 to upgrade your account to get the blockchain stuff, but you can, you can, you can try it out for free without the blockchain. Wow, yeah, that's great. So anyone tuning in, if you want to dip your toes into blockchain gaming, uh, try it for free, pay $10 to, to actually use all the blockchain functionalities. Splinterlands sounds like a good place to start. Um, 
Any other uh, advice for newbies? I think, you know, with this NFT boom, a lot of newbie, new people are coming into the space. Um, people who might just be tuning in, go check out our Reimagine 2021 YouTube channel, smash the subscribe button, uh, watch all of our interviews for this state of the art chain. If you're interested in learning more about NFTs and gaming and these exciting applications for blockchain, um, any other advice about where they should start, what they should look for, where to find you on the internet to read more <laughs> about uh, blockchain yeah. gaming? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So I'm on Twitter at blockchain uh, GMG. Um, I'm very active on uh, YouTube. So I've got a YouTube channel called Blockchain Gaming World. So there's a lot of, I tr try and cover as much as I can and, and do videos about that. I mean, I, I think in general, um, it is still such a very early um, kind of, Kind of stage of the blo of blockchain gaming space i've always found that the, the community in general across all the games are are kind of very uh very open um they're still you know say it's small so it's, it's quite easy to kind of follow you know to, to work out who, who the kind of key people to follow on twitter um and, and um, obviously if you're if you're interested in specific games um then you know pretty much every, everyone's on Discord and those Discord channels are, are pretty active. So um, generally, it's, it's quite a welcoming community. It's, it's, it's pretty small, I would say. You know, it's, you're talking at the moment sort of tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands of people in the entire blockchain game space. So, so you can really delve into it quite quickly. You know, if, if you just kind of spend the time kind of finding the people and, and be enthusiastic, just don't be nasty to people. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for any of you just tuning in, we've been talking with John Jordan. He's a blockchain games consultant and the editor of the website blockchaingamer.biz. So be sure to check out his content if you're interested in blockchain and games and stay tuned for more state of the art chain reimagine 2021 virtual conference series. Mm -hmm.